Golden Drum. It's a real treat to meet all of you, and I've been hearing about you for some years now, and it's nice to just hang out a bit and um, meet your group. Uh, it's been very interesting, Sadek, talking about the whole foundation of your group and about the initiations that your master has gone through. And because of my time, I was born during the war, and my father actually died three months before I was born. So uh, I was of that 60s generation, you know, born in 43. In the 60s, I was in my early 20s and living in New York and doing architecture. And, and very much like many of my friends of, of that generation, we were in a funny position of having to initiate ourselves. And, and we did it through the help of certain substances that came up at around that time also. And it was just a very interesting process because we didn't really know in the beginning where we were heading. And a, a lot of my uh, peers actually still don't know where they're heading. <laughs> However, I was very lucky in the sense that I was drawn to particular ideas, particular concepts, and it was a great help that I had practiced architecture because it gave me a way of visually representing things that are of that symbolic world that Sadek was talking about. Uh, one of the first sets of ideas that I came across, you know, I, in the very beginning, in the 60s, I was still doing architecture, but I was exploring, you know, the work of Carl Jung and also um, people like Rudolf Steiner and the Theosophists and Manly Palmer Hall, you know, the whole traditional Rosicrucian knowledge and so on. And I came across the work of Gurdjieff and Ospensky, Gurdjieff being a Russian mystic. And this diagram comes from a book called The Theory of Celestial Influence by uh, a student uh, of Ospensky. Uh, Peter Ospensky was a famous Russian mathematician who was a student of Gurdjieff. Gurdjieff being a mystic who carried traditions from Central Asia uh, that are partly Tibetan, partly Chinese, partly Sufi, um, combining music, rhythm, cycles, and all kinds of things. And uh, Rodney Collin wrote this book, Theory of Celestial Influence, and this is one of the paintings that Collin made. He called it the long body of the solar system. And to me, this was a very unusual concept because back at that time, uh, and, and in fact, still today, a lot of people think of the sun sitting in space and a planet's moving around it, right? You know, like the Earth makes a rotation once in a year, right? Would you agree with that? Well, actually, it turns out that that isn't the case. And the reason is because... Yeah. The reason is because uh, we are at the periphery of the Milky Way galaxy. This shows the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And the entire galaxy spins. And so our solar system, the sun, is about 2 thirds of the way from the center of the galaxy out to the periphery. And the galaxy moves in this spiraling pattern. And it also, the whole spiral itself moves through space. It turns out that our sun moves a million miles a day, which breaks down to something in the region of 65,000 miles per hour. And as a result, the sun moves around the galactic center and the planets move around it and creates a very, very complex spiral pattern in time. This is a painting that I made for a very early book of mine, which is right here if you want to have a look at it later. It's called The Round Art. Does anyone know what this is, by the way? It's like what you just described. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the idea is that this long filament right here is the sun moving through space and time, uh, because actually this is frozen time. 
And the idea is the sun moves through time and space at this phenomenal rate, a, a million miles a day, therefore 365 million miles every year. The Earth itself rotates at 1,500 miles an hour. It, everything is moving at a phenomenal rate. The planets spiral around the sun through time. So this little innermost spiral right here, the yellow one is Mercury. And then outside of it is Venus, which is green, a bit, bit difficult to see. But then you see the Earth is blue. So that's one cycle, two. And each one of these are years. So this is one year, two years, three years, four years, five, and so on. This actually represents 12 years of time. The hazy area here is the asteroid belt between Mars, which is red, and Jupiter, which is blue. There's Jupiter's orbit out here, right? And it's a kind of hazy area because there are hundreds of thousands of asteroids that, that are, according to modern chaos theory thinkers, it's a kind of, the planets move in a very regular cycle, which is what astrology is about, obviously, but these Asteroids are like a random factor. It's, it's, it's ironic that, of course, almost all of them are named after women. Uh, but it represents this kind of chaotic uh, zone within the solar system where new beings arise. So it's like a place of generation. You know, it's a place where uh, new ideas, new concepts come from. And in, in fact, there are bodies in this zone being discovered almost every day. There are, there are many, many, many of them. So the idea here is that a horoscope, which normally is looked at as a kind of circular diagram, you know, this is my horoscope. In reality, a horoscope is simply a slice taken through the spiraling system, right? At a particular moment in time. It's as though you could gradate the path of the sun according to months, you know, and then according to days and so on. So your horoscope is a slice through this spiraling pattern. And, and it's at an angle that reflects the place where you're born and the time where you're born, right? And so every one of us have a successive and different view of the same spiraling system, okay? So, and this is the kind of archetypal reality. And, and when I developed this whole concept back in the early 70s, it was pretty radical among astrologers to look at this whole system being in movement. And of course, it, to many astrologers, it's actually still radical. So it's only recently that I've been getting certain feedback and information about this, which is quite special and quite extraordinary. So the idea is that if you say that your horoscope is a slice, it doesn't begin with that slice because birth isn't the beginning. And of course, it also doesn't end at that slice either because your life continues as time proceeds. So in fact, my cardinal view of the way astrology works is that it's not a static image that stays the same. It's a process in time. And this leads to all kinds of interesting ideas, postulates, conclusions. Among them being that I began to realize that the birth moment isn't the beginning of the process. Rather, one's conception is. And this to me was a real breakthrough because, you know, again in my case in particular, my father didn't really live during my lifetime. So, I had to look in my own gestation to actually discover his significance to me. <coughs> and that's like Sadek was saying before, it was like I was forced to look within myself and within my life to actually discover that father image, which is often in a man's case, a kind of primary energetic principle and one's identity. So the idea is that I developed a system that I call lifetime astrology where you go back to the time you were conceived and this begins the process. And of course, this has certain implications as well, which is that we all start by a sexual act of our father making love with our mother. And of course, the conception happens within the feminine. It happens within your mother. And from that point on, we see this gestating influence in, you know, from conception to birth. 
is, is very interesting because in nine months approximately, we repeat the entire evolutionary process within your mother. And that uh, the events that happen to her actually trigger influences that exist within you. So in a way, you know, I always was curious, you know, Jung talks about this idea of the collective unconscious, you know, the collective unconscious being a kind of memory that we all share that is collective and goes back through ancient history, back through all humanity. He always talked about it like it was up here somewhere, you know, like it was a kind of thing that was in the atmosphere, or, or Edgar Cayce talking about the Akashic Record. Casey actually talks about it as though it's a kind of library in the sky. But what's interesting with this postulate of mine is that somehow that that memory exists in you. I'm just going to go back a little sec here. Oops, why is it doing that? Oh, here we go. Um, so this is the way a horoscope looks. This is actually the horoscope of the solstice today which happened in New York at about one minute after noon. And this immediately brands it as a very special solstice simply because it's very rare that it happens exactly at noon when the sun is at its maximum point. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. You know, the idea was today when the solstice happened, the sun was directly overhead in New York City. And since the sun governs consciousness, the sun can just as easily be at the midnight point, which is here. And the way the horoscope works, basically, is this is the eastern horizon. This is the western horizon, where the sun sets. It rises in the east, it culminates at the north, I mean at the south, and then sets in the west. So planets above the horizon are in the conscious domain because the horizon is here. So every planet above the horizon both today, but in your particular horoscope, is conscious and objective. In the same way that once the sun sets at sunset, it's going under the Earth's surface, basically, which symbolizes the unconscious, conscious and unconscious, direct influences, indirect influences, the objective reality of one, and the subjective reality. This is very appropriate because the sun is consciousness, and it's the masculine principle, and the moon is the unconscious and the feminine principle. And of course, the sun is just entering Capricorn, and the moon is in the middle of the sign Leo. So being a Leo myself, I happen to think that this is a little more propitious than usual. But of course, it's a very interesting connection between Earth, Earth and fire. But traditional astrology is interesting because it's like they make an assumption that this chart comes into being at birth and the, the whole of you is there. And, and I don't really make a similar assumption because I think that that horoscope that is uh, triggered at the birth moment is something that unfolds in time. And this diagram is from Robert Flood, who was an, an early alchemist, essentially a scientist, who wrote an amazing book that's called The History of Two Worlds, and it's called Utriusque Cosmi Historia. It's like the history of the microcosm. And this expresses very clearly uh, a principle that's fundamental to my whole approach to astrology, but also it's something that you would likely have studied as well here. See this man, he is, he's standing astride what is called here the microcosm. And the microcosm means either the small world or it means the inner world. Okay, it's microcosmos. It's a cosmos, it's a world. And we see a sun and a moon and a series of planetary rings, you know, the sun, moon, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, around the periphery, we see the signs of the zodiac. So that means that within each being is a zodiac uh, with planets, constellations, stars, zodiac signs, and the sun and moon. This is the macrocosm outside, and there's also a sun and a moon, and a series of planetary rings, and a ring of fixed stars, which are the zodiac. So it's like he's saying that there's a, 
there's a zodiac in you and there's also a zodiac around you. Macrocosm means the large world, the outer world. So it's like that, 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 that idea of as above, so below, or the microcosm is the macrocosm. But there's a very interesting little bit of information here for those of you who like symbolism. You see that little being in the upper right? He's a little putty, he's a little angel. But we can identify what he symbolizes by looking at him. Look at his feet, goat feet. That identifies him as Saturn. Saturn being the god of time, equivalent to Set in Egypt, uh, connected to Bacchus, uh, and so on, which are all symbols of time. And also on his head, you notice a little sand clock, which in the 17th century, 1700s, was the way one actually kept time. And also, there's a little cross, you see that kind of jagged cross on the top of the sand clock up here? Right? Now that's an ancient symbol for Saturn. The cross is matter, and the two interlocking moons, which is what the sickle is, are, are the two qualities of the feminine, both the light and the dark quality of the feminine. Indeed, this time of the year, the Druids at Christmas cut mistletoe with a silver scythe. They cut those white beads off the side, of, and mistletoe only grows on oak trees. So on the solstice in England, Northern Europe, mistletoe is actually cut with this silver sickle symbolizing the feminine, and it's essentially castrating the year. So, so at this time of the year, what we do is we castrate the year, and people kiss and start to generate a new year. And that's exactly one of the deeper symbolic qualities that we're experiencing today. But anyway, this little putty, which is time, is carrying a cord. Do you see this spiral cord? And it's wrapping around the microcosm and the macrocosm four times. And to me, I began realizing at one point that spiral wrapping cord that, that binds the microcosm to the macrocosm is very significant, and I will show you why. If this represents the solar system moving through time, I began realizing when I made this painting many years ago, it actually sits in my living room in Hudson, New York now, but I began realizing suddenly that this diagram, when you look at it, because this is the Earth's point of view, we're seeing this from the Sun's point of view. This is a solar version of it. If you drew it from the Earth's point of view, it would look like the Earth and the Sun are spiraling around each other. Indeed, of course, as you know, until the 17th century, everyone believed that the Sun moved around the Earth, which is a result of this, this phenomenon. But if you draw this as a double helix, it begins to look suspiciously like the DNA molecule. What's interesting is that the DNA molecule and the solar system, when it's shown moving through time, have the same exact form, shape, geometry, number, and cyclical quality. I happen to believe there's a, there's a process in physics called resonance. And resonance is that any two things that have a similar pattern, in time and space, no matter how far apart they are, instantaneously exchange information. So the idea is that the DNA molecule in every cell in your body is resonating with the spiral solar system around us. Every one of us are on this earth. <laughs> in fact, when we, when we are conceived, when we incarnate, we become subject, you know, at some point in the past. Uh, at that moment that we incarnate, we become subject to the laws of the spiraling solar system. There are a set of physical laws. We have a body, physical body. In the Platonic view, we have an emotional body. We have a mental body, we have a spiritual body, and maybe many others. You know, uh, almost every culture has its own model. So my idea basically is that instead of looking at the static image as a horoscope, that we're really talking about movement in time and that the microcosm and the macrocosm resonate with each other. 
Something you might be interested to know also is that, is that of course, I began uh, trying to realize that when a sperm and egg meet, I began thinking, when did that egg actually come into being in your mother? And, and I discovered that not only did I not know, but I knew very few women in the early 70s in, in England who knew. Uh, and, and the reason is that the uh, ova, the eggs from which we're conceived, are in your mother just after she's conceived. And that egg was in your grandmother around the time she was conceived, and it was in your great-grandmothers, all of them, at the time they were conceived. So the, the human ovum, which we come from, is eternal. It's always existed, and it always will exist. So it, there's something actually that was kind of developed in the meantime. I postulated these ideas in the early 70s. But this idea of matrilineal DNA, you probably know about it now, that there's the DNA itself really follows the paternal line, the father's line of the family. But there's a matrilineal DNA called mitochondrial DNA that tracks your mother's lineage. Some very interesting things happen. A great friend of mine who prides herself on being uh, extremely uh, kind of spiritual Jewish woman discovered recently that she has 25% Lutheran genes from, 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 from uh, Scandinavia. So obviously a wandering Swede managed to somehow penetrate, I mean literally penetrate, that, that lineage of hers that she had thought of as being absolutely pure. When you look at this in process, we see something like, this is a recent image. I, you know, when I came out with these ideas to talk about the sun moving through time and space was like a radical idea, especially that it made a pattern like this. This is a recent uh, constructed image by NASA that showed the solar system moving through time and that it actually has a tail. Just like I'm showing, the residue of these planetary cycles. This is a little imagery. We keep visualizing, and we teach this in schools to all the children. That this the is not so terrible. There's a sun in the middle, and planets going in circles around it like this. And we, I mean, in my school, we even had a little device where you had the sun in the middle, and you could turn the little uh, thing on the bottom, and, and the planets would go around. And, you know, is this true? No, absolutely not. In fact, thinking of the solar system this way is equivalent to thinking the Earth is flat. Uh, the sun is moving at thousands of miles per second through space, and our planets are following, producing a huge elliptical core in space. And year after year, we do not trace the, the same uh, circle in space. We're actually thousands and thousands and millions of miles from where we were the year before. So to think of our solar system as some flat structure that's, uh, that's stationary is again the result of isolating a system and trying to analyze it. And, and typically when you do so, you get the wrong data. As soon as you open the system and you realize the solar system is inside the galaxy and moving through space, then you realize that actually we're making a pilgrimage, literally, through space as we evolve. And you could even think of it in the concept of a, of a vacuum structure, that we are embedding all of our evolution on the structure of the vacuum as we move through that great spiral we're producing through space. Every single individual on our planet producing that very specific spiral in space. And we could follow it back for any individual all the, back, all the way back when, to when they were in the womb of their mother, which connects their spiral with their mother's spiral. And then follow that back and again and again and again. And that is the continuity of the information inside the gene the gene structure of our evolution through space. And now we, we get a much more complete view of the structure of the mechanics of our evolution. 
So you can imagine when I saw this just two years ago, what a validation of this idea and Haramain talking about the fact that it's embedded not only in you, but it's about tracking this whole process back into time. So, as you noticed before, I've written a number of books about astrology and this technique that I call lifetime astrology, but it also led me to begin looking at the idea of reincarnation. Meaning if you can identify events in a person's ongoing spiraling life, you can also track it back through history and back into time. Now, the whole idea of, of, of similarity is, is, is now often called the fractal nature of reality, meaning that, that cycles function at a number of different levels. But, but this idea of self-same connections, of, of something in the microcosm, in an individual cell, resonating and acting the same way as the spiraling solar system, they reflect each other. Look at this. This top diagram shows the structure of neurons in the brain, meaning the neuron is connected to other neurons by a series of very interesting energetic exchanges. This bottom diagram shows a computer simulation of the entire universe. They could be the same thing. So there's a, you know, this idea of macrocosm and microcosm is very dynamic and it's something that's now being accepted in the world of physics, modern biology, gene research, and so on. And, and I see it as being a kind of renaissance in a way because it opens up the whole model. Talk about, you know, a lot of astrologers talk, at your, talk about a horoscope like you're branded with this particular image at a certain time. We're moving, everything's moving. We have this opportunity to really imagine the whole spiral, to look at our life as a process in time, and that's exactly what my technique kind of implied. And this comes from a lot of, also a lot of areas. This on the left is the wheel of samsara, you might be familiar with, which is a Tibetan Buddhist idea that, that we start at conception, we are born, we live through our life, we live into old age, then we die, and then the process starts all over again. You know, and, and, and this kind of cyclical element of life is something that I found also is obvious in the horoscope itself. And so the model I created looks a bit like this. You know, uh, when I first started learning astrology, in the same way I made it like a rough drawing of that spiraling solar system, I began looking at the, the, the houses of the chart, you know, numbered from one, two, three, four, and so on. This is the ascendant on the left, which is the birth moment. That's the sign on the eastern horizon at the time you were born. What I thought was very peculiar was that the first house also is, is the self, it's the personality, but it also relates to bonding with your mother. But then I began thinking, this is kind of funny because the seventh house is partnership, marriage, going out into the world. But then the eighth house, only two thirds of the way through the houses, is the house of Scorpio, it's the house of death. It's the house of separation, the end of life. And I thought, how can that be the end when it's only two thirds of the way through? So it turns out actually that this is the end of life and that the cusp of the ninth house, which is right here, is the conception point. And this, this basic model is something that I kind of construed from Rodney Collins' work. And so what happens is that if this is the life process from birth through childhood, you can see these ages, uh, seven years old, 13, 23, 42, and then in the late 70s is the death point, that this upper left quadrant is the gestation octave. It starts with conception on the cusp of the ninth house because in the same way that the eighth house in Scorpio is death in the end of the process, Sagittarius governs new life. It represents, you know, uh, rebirth. It represents higher mind. It represents long journeys. And I thought, that's interesting, you know, because when you're conceived, the sperm makes a long journey to get to the egg in the first place, which, by the way, often takes anywhere between 24 and 72 hours for the sperm to just get to the egg. And then the fertilization process happens so, and then that fertilized ovum 
has to travel all the way up the fallopian tube into the wall, into the uterus, and embed itself in the uterine wall. And this whole process takes days. So the idea is that our life does begin with a long journey. And this became my kind of working model of a life process. Uh, from the conception point to birth, all of this happens within your mother's body. So we have to see what happens from her point of view. Right? And then at the moment of birth, we come into the world. So during gestation, we repeat this entire evolutionary process in the womb. And this is therefore the octave of our physical body. Because the genes of your father, the sun, and your mother, the moon, integrate. And so in the same way in the horoscope, the sun is your father, and that masculine energy in you, it also represents all of the qualities that you inherit from your father and your father's side of the family. In the same way, the moon represents your mother, and it represents all the qualities you inherit from your mother and your mother's side of the family. So what do you think happens when someone's born at a full moon? What kind of relationships is your parent, are your parents likely to have? It's oppositional. They're polar opposites. The father is one way, the mother is exactly the opposite. They may come from different cultures, different belief systems. They may look differently. They may have different beliefs about things and so on. In the same way that a trine relationship, which is a third of the circle, is a harmonious connection that often means the mother and father have a lot of things in common, a lot of easy connections, and, and so on. So the, the, the time scale also that I use is, is quite unusual because another point Colin makes is that in our lives, time is not regular. And, and what he means by this is that a day when you're in your 30s and 40s is not the same as a day when you are five or six or seven. Do you remember waiting for Christmas or your equivalent of it when you were five or six or seven years old? It lasted forever. You know, that, that last day or the last two days, time moves incredibly slowly when we're young. And as we age, time accelerates. It moves faster and faster. To give you some idea, you know, I'm, I'm just 70 now, you know, I feel simultaneously like a teenager, but also, in, in a way, also very old. And I think of the 80s as being recently, you know, and, and this is because there's like a foreshortening of time. That a 10 year period of time, uh, when you're in your maturity time, in your 50s, 60s, and 70s, passes as quickly as, as uh, a year did when you were a teenager, or a week did when you were a young child. So when you're, when you're my age and you sit around young kids who are like incredibly hyperactive and running all over the place, they see me sit down and read a newspaper, to them it's like I'm there for weeks, months. <laughs> it's like I'm, I haven't moved, you know? It's like I'm totally static, frozen in time. And so, the, the, the important issue is that the farther back in your life planetary influences register, the more vivid they are and the more powerful they function within you. Later influences pass by very quickly. It's like, you know, when, when we're young, it's like a relationship that lasted a couple of weeks when you're, you know, 16 or 18 or 20 or something, uh, could very easily seem like it's functioning for a long, long time. But then it's over, and you look back on it suddenly, you know, 40 years later, and realize, wow, what, what an impact that very brief interlude actually had. The progression is actually logarithmic, meaning logarithms go 1 to 10 to 100 to 1,000 are, are perceptually equal. So we experience as much in the seven months of, of just nine months of gestation. Uh, as we do in the seven years of childhood or in the 70 years of maturity. And, and, and in these octaves during gestation, we create a physical body. At birth, our personality, our rising sign is an emotional body. And this is when we uh, develop and are exposed to emotional patterns in childhood. And then at about seven, we go off to school. We start becoming aware of other ideas and the octave of maturity from seven to 77 plus 
is, is the mental body. It's the way we think about the world and so on. So I sometimes do a very simple diagram. You can see up here, this is a, just an archetypal chart in a way. You can see the conception point is the ninth cusp. And when the ninth cusp is in Capricorn, Capricorn's an earth sign. It's very conservative in some ways. It's very controlling. That says to me that, that when your mother, or when this person's mother conceived them, that she was trying to be in control. And that this indicates also, because the conception point in your horoscope is your capacity to conceive on a biological level, but also on a spiritual, metaphorical, or creative level. Meaning someone who has a very active conception is going to be the kind of person who comes up with all kinds of ideas and, 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 and tries to conceive developmental stages in their lives. You know, like Leo on the conception point means people that are incredibly fertile, like ideas just come out of them on a regular basis. Capricorn's a little more conservative, it's a little more st static and stable. The MC registers when the mother realizes that she's pregnant. And the midheaven is actually often 49 days after conception, which in the context of Tibetan Buddhism, they say that when you die, you go through what they call the bardo state, which is a, a time from between one death and the next rebirth that has a duration in earth time of 49 days, seven times seven, seven weeks. And during that time, we move through the world of, of other spirits, essentially, until we are drawn to a womb, which is pre-existing. By, by the time, uh, when we're conceived, we're a, a, a single-celled ovum. By the time 49 days have happened, we become fully human for the first time. We've passed through these, you know, invertebrate, vertebrate, lower mammals, higher mammals. We go through all these evolutionary stages in the ninth house. In fact, if you look at an image of someone at that time in the first 49 days, we look like a brain with a little tiny skeletal system attached. So this shows us from the mother's point of view, uh, Capricorn on the midheaven, square to the moon, because the moon is your mother, this indicates a person whose mother, when she realized she was pregnant with them, didn't want to be pregnant. In fact, I see, if, if you go back from the conception point this way, that tells me that the son, which is the father, is the parent responsible for the impulse to conceive this person. If you go back from conception and come to the moon first, it means your mother. But the paradox here is that the father is responsible for the impulse to conceive this person, but the son's directly opposite the conception point. That shows me an accidental conception. Right? So that means the father initiated the conception but didn't really want a child to ensue. Do you think the mother agreed with him? A square between sun and moon is a competitive relationship. So here this person is in the unfortunate position, and this is the way I work on a kind of psychotherapeutic level and or on a medical or health level, which is that this person wasn't really wanted by either of their parents. And that becomes a really major issue because, because it's in gestation, which is when your body is created, this person's body is the ground during which this sense of alienation is actually conceived and created. So you can see, I've just abstracted the other planets out of that equation. But to be born in such a situation is intensely problematic, but using traditional astrology, you'd never see it. You'd never know that. You wouldn't have a clue. So what I do, you know, in my book, Astrology and the Art of Healing, I was talking to you earlier, that what I would do looking at this horoscope is someone needs incredibly deep body work, like rolfing, or shiatsu massage, or massage that really works into the internal organ systems, you know, like rolfing can do, and so on. Because, you know, in a way during gestation, the, the traumas are held in your body. You can identify that using this technique of astrology. This, this shows the stages of gestation. It's interesting because, you know, uh, Sagittarius is the ninth house, the centaur. 
Capricorn is the, the, the tenth house, Aquarius is the eleventh house, and Pisces is the twelfth house. These happen to be the archetypal symbols of gestation, right? During Sagittarius, in that first, first 49 days, we go through these animal stages, you know, these pre-human stages, and finally the human being in us emerges. Look at the symbol of a horse's body and a human torso. So the Sagittarian energy is, is a lower animalistic and, and purely physical energy, and on top of it is a human dynamic, a more spiritual energy that's trying to emerge and shoot its arrow into the stars. So this symbolizes also during the ninth house, as I said, we're basically a brain with a little tiny skeletal system attached. We look like this, right? During Capricorn from seven weeks until 13 weeks after conception, this is a very peculiar symbol because it's called the goatfish. And guess what? During Capricorn, which is ruled by Saturn, the 10th house, our skeletal system develops. And this is the spine. You know the way the spine looks like that? Mm -hmm. You know? That's the goatfish. That symbolizes the 10th house, your structure in life. Your, you know, medically, Capricorn has to do with the spine, with the bones. It's again a Saturn ruled sign. Aquarius, pouring this water, you know, from one vessel into another is all about the sympathetic and parasympathetic nervous system, which develops in that mid stage. And then in Pisces, the last three months of, of gestation, the two fish, one of them is often seen swimming up into consciousness and the other down into the unconscious. So connected by an umbilical cord, just as we exist within our mothers during that last stage of gestation, connected to her by an umbilical cord. The American astronaut John Glenn, you know, who was the first man, uh, first man in space, uh, had the node and the horoscope, which represents one's association with others, in the 12th house in Aries. And that meant that, that in the last stage of gestation, just before he was born, he was trying to navigate his mother from inside. Right? He was, he was trying to run the spaceship connected by the umbilical cord. And so when he was in a weightless state, he felt perfectly comfortable and happy because he had experienced it before. <laughs> so when I do a chart, which looks, this is Carl Jung's horoscope, then it tells you things about a person's life, starting at conception, into gestation, birth moment, childhood, um, you know, like at seven years old, Jung, the moon and Pluto conjunct as a traumatic emotional experience. Jung's father was a country pastor in Switzerland, and, and a dead person came down the river and stuck in the, in the sticks outside of their house. So Jung saw death for the first time. He also had very intense dreams at around this point. Uh, he had a, a famous dream that registered in him when he was about nine or ten years old, and the dream was so interestingly intrauterine that, that, that he was in a meadow and it was very lush flowers and he saw this cavern opening up into the ground and he looked at it and it was a bit afraid because the walls were made out of flesh. They were flesh colored. And he walked down into the cavern and he saw this phallus to say, to say the least, this phallic shape in an underground chamber, and it had like a glow around the top of it. And he heard his mother's voice saying, that's him, that's the monster. And then he then woke up. And Jung wrote about this dream in Memories, Dreams, and Reflections, his autobiography. And I really think that it actually was a resonance of, of a kind of slightly illicit sexual act that happened during Jung's gestation. See, Mars represents penetration, it represents a doctor's internal examination, and so on. Similarly, over here, when Jung was 23, the son registers, uh, he was really disconnected from his father, and this was exactly the year that he met Sigmund Freud, and Freud always talked about Jung as being his spiritual son and heir. And, and again, this on the, on the right here shows a list of dates that a computer program I have 
uh, generates starting at the time you're conceived and going all the way up to 99 years old. And, and I pick out some of these events when the planets register. And each event, like the moon, represents you know, women in your life, times when you have ex extremely emotional experiences. But also the moon resonates. It's at 15 degrees Taurus. It'll resonate over here at around eight years old. It'll resona resonate over here at around 16 years old. It'll resonate here when Uranus registered and he began having kind of illicit relationships when he was in his 30s and also split up with Freud. So he met Freud under the sun. He went on his own way under Uranus. And when, he, when Jung was much older in his 70s and 80s, he followed alchemy, which is indicated by the sign Jupiter astrologically. So we see our life is a kind of unfolding in time that, that puts your being in a very interesting kind of situation. How are we for time? I have no idea. It's more than yeah, we've got about 15 minutes more, if that's okay. Are you? Oh, yeah. 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 You're actually doing pretty good. Yeah. I was invited in, my book, The Round Art, was published in the late 80s, I mean, late 70s, excuse me, 1978. And, and in the early 80s, I was invited to appear on a program on British primetime television, and it was called Brass Tax. And the idea was that it was supposed to be like an investigative re reporting program, and they wanted to investigate astrology with a view of, of dishing it, obviously. The BBC announcer that presented the program was notoriously critical of anything having to do with spirituality, psychology, and so on. But the producer became quite a good friend of mine, and I said to her, just before we go on the air, could you give me his birth horoscope information? I'll make a chart. I want to just do a little 20 minute reading for him before we go live uh, in prime time television, you know, in front of 20 million people. And so I sat down with him and, and I had seen this horoscope already and I said, I said, actually you have a very interesting horoscope because I think you were illegitimate. And this guy turns so pale. You couldn't believe it, and, and I, I proceeded to explain to him how he was conceived. Okay, so... <laughs> Here's the conception point, right? And what you do is, 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 this is into gestation, we go back to see whether it was his father or mother responsible for the impulse to conceive him, and we come to the moon, which is his mother. Moon in Aries. What is she like at this time? She's very independent, uh, very self-possessed, but also very spontaneous and intuitive in terms of how she functions, which is characteristic of Eric's mood. It's also below the horizon, meaning that she's very strong but doesn't quite recognize her own strength yet. She's still a bit unconscious. She hasn't really developed herself and come into her own yet. Moon opposite Neptune, alcohol. Aha, <laughs> bad judgment. <laughs> Moon opposite Neptune means A, a seduction, but it also corresponds to alcohol, to drugs, and also even to anesthetic. So if you have uh, a Neptune or Moon aspect to your ascendant in the birth chart, which is your birth moment, then it very often means that your mother had an anesthetic while you were birthed which also means a tendency to addictive qualities and things of that sort, or a tendency to kind of be a little unrealistic about things. So, so she's very unrealistic about things, and yet, look at this, look at the sun, is the father, is part of a T-square with the moon and Neptune. You see this T-square here? Moon, Neptune opposite, mutually square the sun. The sun in the 12th house means that the father, when this relationship happened, the father was very secretive about it which immediately makes me think, especially with Sun conjunct Mars, he was already married to someone. And in fact, he was. Uh, the two of them met, the mother and father met. The mother initiated the conception. The father obviously pretended to resist, but clearly didn't. And so this little constellation here, you know, led me to then say, okay, well, what happened once she the conception point is here at one degree of Scorpio. 
That often means, Scorpio, as I said before, is about separation, it's about hidden emotions, it's very deep feelings, but with a difficulty really expressing them clearly. And then we see that we've got um, Chiron in Scorpio and Jupiter in Scorpio occurring just after the conception point. And that's, she realized she was pregnant here. And the idea here is that, in a way, she began feeling something very deeply inside of her, but wasn't really sure yet what it was. And when she realized she was pregnant, Venus Jupiter is usually very joyful. But then she began realizing, I'm not married. You know, the man who fathered my child, Semi Square, indicates relationships where there are conditions attached. You know, like, Unconditional love is one thing, but conditional love means I love you as long as you behave this way and do that, and if you don't, then I withdraw my affection and connection to you, okay? So these semi-squares, 45 degrees, which is between a square uh, and a conjunction, or a sesquiquadrant, which is 135 degrees, are both conditional aspects. So she kept it all secret. She didn't tell anyone that she was pregnant. And her husband went back to his wife. Around this time, just before the child was born, the father found out that she was pregnant. Because at this point, she's really showing it. And he was so enamored of her that he left his wife and stayed with her. So this guy grew up believing that his mother and father were together from the time that he was conceived, which they weren't. So he literally was illegitimate. But the finishing touch, and at this point, this guy was so pale. <laughs> and I knew beforehand that he had political aspirations. He wanted to be like a British politician. And you know, the British press will have a way of finding out about things like that. But the finishing touch was this, that, that around the circle, each of these constellations resonate at different places. And I said, hmm, the opposite of the sun and Mars registers right over here, the, the descendant is around 23 and a half years old. And I said, I said, by the way, what happened to you when you were 22? And he went pale a second time <laughs> because he was married and he had a re relationship uh, outside of his marriage and conceived a child and left his wife to go with the woman that he had the relationship with in exact repetition of his own conception. This guy was so nice to me on the television program <laughs> that, that the BBC complained because it was supposed to be like, you know, take the piss out of astrology because it doesn't work. <laughs> and so it was an inalienable situation where he was just so shocked. He said, you know, the guy remained a friend of mine for years afterwards simply because it was so shocking to be able to look. I mean, this is, mind you, in a, a totally exaggerated case. Most people's lives are not so dramatic, but it's also fascinating what you can see using this technique. You know, I've now you know, been doing it for 40 odd years, and so you develop understandings of how these lives develop and what they mean and how to work with them, because in the same way they have psychological values they also represent, if you can see them in, in a different context, a pattern of your spiritual life, a pattern of your emotional life, a pattern of your health, and so on. Aspects, you know, in the middle look a lot like, I, I give a talk called Chaos Theory in Astrology, and aspects work a bit like this, which is called a strange attractor. If you have a Venus-Mars aspect, it means that you know, you have a, a, a kind of affectionate and integrative quality, and also it swings into its opposite, which is more aggressive and self-centered quality. And you flip-flop from one to the other until you begin to figure out how to actually integrate both of those sides of your being. You know, Churchill's is an interesting chart because he also was, was, was conceived with Pluto on the conception point, totally accidental, and it almost even could be uh, considered a rape. But also, Pluto is fated. When you have Pluto on the conception point, it means incredibly fated conception. And if you date Pluto's, uh, Churchill's chart, and go all the way back around again, if Pluto registers in his life in, in 1939, when he was 
asked to be Prime Minister of England and was seen as the savior of the British people. So his conception, which his father tried to get out of, you know, his mother was American, his father was a, a titled Brit, was a fated moment and that this, you know, potential tragedy of the conception point is something that became his strongest quality when he became older and, and more notorious. Again, this is, a, this is a chart I love to show when I go to England because I lived in England for 20 years and my daughter still does. But this chart shows essentially that Prince Harry's father was not Prince Charles. <laughs> because I don't know if you know this, but you know, there's been a, you know, around the time Prince Harry, the younger of the two English princes, was conceived, uh, Diana and Charles weren't really in relationship any longer. And, and, and Prince Harry's father was this, you know, red-haired guardsman with whom Diana had a long-term relationship. You know, they met riding horses together naturally and, and one thing led to another. And if you look at Prince Harry and Prince William, they don't look anything remotely alike. And, and this is a kind of secret in British kind of <laughs> conspiracy theory. But, but again, it shows with son in the eighth house, it often means that the person you think of as your father often isn't. You know, I, I use a book just for your reference. This is a book called, uh, by Reinhold Everton, it's called The Combination of Stellar Influences. And for any planetary combination like Saturn Uranus, you know, Saturn's inhibition, Uranus is like wanting to break through inhibition. So it represents things like irritability and inhibition and tension. And Everton's great because it has positive negative psychological correspondences but it also has biological correspondences, meaning here's what's happening in your psychological life. The biological correspondences are what's happening in your body and in your physiology. And these are event manifestations. And these are sociological correspondences, which is the way it often manifests as a person. So the whole technique that I use, you know, is really about looking at this four body model. And this just shows transits, you can take these cycles and predict. You know, in the same way that, that the chart isn't just that circle, if you put a chart on the table like this, in fact, it makes a spiral. Because if you put the chart down, you go from conception to birth to childhood to maturity, and it creates this cylinder, I call it the cylinder of life. Very much like the solar system, right? This is the slice, which is your birth moment. And as you age from conception, the cylinder fills up with layers of memories. These are intrauterine. These are childhood memories that are emotional. This is the mental body during maturity from, end of, from 7 to 77. And I actually postulate a fourth higher <coughs> level that I call a transcendent or transpersonal level. And that, that is funny because it's the higher octave of the events of gestation. So, your mother conceiving and carrying you is a pattern of your uh, spiritual and transcendent development in eternity in a higher realm. And of course, you see the arrow at the top, that of course what happens is that you can go back down before your conception and talk about your previous life where the transcendent octave of your previous life is coincident to the gestation octave of this life. And similarly, your transcendent experiences in this lifetime that you're encouraging through your initiatic school are actually programming the gestation of your next incarnation. So again, I've written a number of books about reincarnation and the divine life is one of them right there. And again, the whole idea is that this, the planets moving through that spiral horoscope is again the spiraling solar system and the DNA molecule. You know, if you look at things like the chakra system in the East, the two base chakras represent gestation. The navel and the heart are childhood and the emotional chakras. The throat and the brow are the mental chakras. And the crown represents the transcendent. So these models, whether it's a theosophical model or the chakra model, all kind of make sense within this particular context. I'm going to show you a, a website address a little bit in just a moment or two 
that um, will allow you to download some of this material. It's like a, a handout I did for, for uh, some lectures that I did last year. My website is atman.net, A-T-M-A-N-N.net, and I'll, the link will be on the next. Yeah, I mean, just as an example, this is from a book called uh, Astrology and the Art of Healing, and it shows the gestation process. There are particular therapies and therapists that correspond to each of those stages of life. Like, if you have a problematic birth, then rebirthing or primal scream is really the way to go. Freud really dealt primarily with childhood. Piaget's development went up to 12 or 13. Um, Ronnie Lang, who I met back in those days, the psychiatrist in England, you know, his first book was Sanity, Madness, and the Family. The fourth house is about family systems. He then went back and back and back and, and eventually did a lot of rebirthing. Wilhelm Reich and, and LSD therapies are about conception and death and things like this. So this is, this is one of my calendars that Sadek was talking about as being very complex, which of course it is. But during, during the 70s, I actually made these calendars almost every year. And, um, and we did a little video together, Sadek and I, explaining exactly how this worked. But, but again, I feel like something unusual is happening because with discovering Nassim Haramein a couple of years ago, uh, and also, uh, I'm beginning to realize suddenly that this work I've done for the last 40 years has not gone silent, but rather I'm getting all kinds of validations. And, and, and the last one I wanted to just show you is a physicist called Garrett Lisi, who, who believes that he's found the way to link the four, talk about the four directions before in your ritual, that there are four fundamental forces in the universe. And that gravity has always been very difficult to incorporate because no one knew how gravity formed or came into being. And it came into being because everything's moving so quickly. This is Garrett Lisi. Just, just look at the shape of these things as they resonate with. Did you have play? Do I? Um, <laughs> oh, yes, there it is. Lisi's theory of everything unites gravity with the other fundamental forces of nature using this intricate pattern, 4E8. Elementary particles... See, the same features, image as that calendar that I used as a way Red, to describe a year of time. green, blue, and purple triangles represent various quarks, and yellow and gray triangles denote leptons, a type of particle that includes electrons and neutrinos. Particles that carry a force are depicted by circles. Rotating this model reveals how the fundamental forces are hidden within its structure. Think about every mandala you've ever seen, you know, <laughs> geometric diagrams. DC uses a star-like pattern to show the relationship between gravity and the electron weak force. It's also the same geometry the as the astrology. The green particles that carry gravity while the yellow circles represent the particles that carry the electron weak force. The blue circular blue ones that carry the strong force emerge from the center. Here, electrons and neutrinos fall to the center, forming another star shape. At the same time, quarks and antiquarks cluster around the edges. Within each cluster, the quarks congregate into families of three, with each family member forming the point of a triangle. It's not that important to really look at the... I also just wanted to show you one more thing. This is... on uh, with the Dalai Lama about neuroscience and meditation. I just thought you might be interested to see this. <laughs> Here's a man who's lost his country, his freedom, his people. 
and yet he exudes so much kindness and compassion and joyfulness. Is it his brain? Is his mind wired for happiness? Is it his faith, his belief, his religion? Or is it something that he's trained his mind to do? In order to achieve happy life, joyful life, we have to take care about our mind. But what is happiness? A sunrise, a child smiling, love, compassion, a fleeting thought. But these are just passing moments. Is there a more permanent happiness that can be cultivated in the mind? In 2013, join us on a quest with the Dalai Lama as we explore the secret to the art and science of happiness. Anyway, it just goes to show the importance of meditation. Uh, this is the information I was talking about. This is a handout that if you're interested in some of the astrological information, and, and this is just contact information. I do readings. Uh, I come to New York fairly regularly. Uh, I do them by Skype and by phone and so on. Does anyone have any questions about any of this? I know it's a lot to take on. And Yes? Um, I really love the imagery and the comparisons and you know the revelation of wow this looks at this and this looks at this and um, it looks like in your movie that's coming there may be some answers about this but in these revelations is there anything practical to the daily person driving in traffic and you know I'm worried about their expenses and yeah, I do you, readings for such people all the time <laughs> and I mean but like you know, just like as far as like the grander scheme, you know, the personal scheme, I, I understand clearly, but like the sort of social. You mean the, collect the collective dynamic? Yeah, yeah, that's more. Just, have you thought about that? I'm, well, I'm well, yeah, in a, in a way, yes, because the outer planets in astrology, and especially the way I do it, like Uranus, Neptune, Pluto, are generational. So, you know, in the same way Uranus and Pluto were conjunct in Virgo in, in the 1960s, you know, I think from 1955 or something until 1972, they were roughly in the same, same place. That, that describes a whole generational influence. Actually, it's being triggered right now by Uranus and Pluto being in square. So there's a way of looking at astrology called mundane, which really deals with what happens in the public eye. What's the larger overview? Um, you know, like for example, Neptune's in Pisces now, and, and Neptune represents fantasy, illusion, lacks of, lack of boundaries. Look at the political situation, look at the spying scandal, happened just as Neptune went into the sign Pisces. So, you know, it takes a little probing to actually see these things, and it takes a bit of knowledge of astrology to, you know, to really appreciate what they signify. But it, it's, it is fascinating because looking at the outer planets in, in a person's chart reading show basically what their next cycle of the next 10, 15, 20 years is going to be ab about and what form it may take. So, yeah, that's included in it, but you know, the material I've been talking about today is actually very personal and very much about one's own particular process. And the most important thing is it gets people to really think about their lives, you know? To, in the beginning, I try to get you to to, to try to really identify with your mother and understand what she would have felt during that time in the same way that you identify with father and try to understand what his relationship with your mother was. It's not like your relationship is like theirs, but the structures in it are very similar and resonant, and, and those structures exist in you too. So I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah. I'm wondering about um, how the future plays into this. So how much of the future in your own life or someone else's life can you see in this life and future lives? Um, I think that 
one of the things you're talking about is what people call fate, you know? Right. Like, are you fated to be a particular way? Uh, I happen to think that, that, that this technique that I've developed has a kind of freeing effect on people in the sense that I'm not saying this is what you're going to become, but what you can look at is which of the dynamics that in the past have arisen for you and have you been able to really work through them so that you can move through your life process clearly because otherwise people get stopped by it, it becomes blockages. And those psychological blockages can, can translate into either you know, psychological blockages or even physical health blockages. So knowing about them makes a big difference because you can maybe find the correct therapy, you can do yoga, you can meditate, you can do various things to kind of correct that process. In terms of the overall collective, that's a whole other thing. It's, it still remains to be seen where this is all heading because we're in a, it's a catastrophic time in many ways. And so one other question about that that I have is when you look at um, people who might have broken out of the wheel of karma with great masters, um, what would that look, how does that look on a chart? Um, because if, you know, I'm thinking about this in terms of karma, right? right? right. So how does that, what would that look like? Well, I think, you know, karma in, in Tibetan Buddhism really, uh, samskaras are, are karmic incidents or dynamics that are essentially uh, traces of unfulfilled causes. Mm -hmm. So by being more aware of what you bring into being in this lifetime, you by extension become much more aware because the more we bring into being without really being aware of it, the more baggage we carry, essentially. And so I'm not just saying to people you can eliminate all that baggage, but the first step is really knowing what it is and what might be ways of working with it. You know, and again, like my Astrology and the Art of Healing book, I really suggest therapies that correspond to particular planets. And, and you know, there are ways to work on these things, but it's important to know which issues are the dominant ones and, and how to go about you know, moving them to something else. Um, yeah, I'd like to know, like, can you give, um, would you be able to give me like a chart reading? Uh, I, I, I do readings for people all the time. <laughs> Call me. I mean, <laughs> call me. That's what I do. <laughs> yes. Uh, I was talking to somebody the other day about Vedic astrology, and one of the things that comes up in conversation about uh, astrology is the comparison between Western and Vedic astrology. And I was wondering if you had any thoughts on that, whether it be the, the accuracy of the two or just what what you see as the differences in the strengths of each? They're very different, for one thing. I mean, they're for, obviously there are tremendous similarities, but there also, there also are major differences, mainly philosophical ones. Mm -hmm. You know, I know a lot of the best Vedic practitioners in the US, and, and Vedic astrology is much more pragmatic and practical, by and large. Western astrology has taken a direction in the last 30 or 40 or 50 years, which is much more psychological. And I think, I think I'm probably more in that camp than in any other, but astrology back in the Middle Ages and even before that was, was really a very practical thing. It told you what steps to take to, you know, to enhance your fate and your fortune and so on. And Vedic astrology works very much like that. I mean, a lot of people I know who do Vedic astrology work primarily with business people. It's great for, you know, for scheduling meetings, for talking about practical, pragmatic relationships and so on. Um, you know, it has its spiritual side, but it's much less pronounced. It's also much more fated. I mean, in India, people believe that, you know, that when you come into the world, that your future is really written on a palm leaf somewhere and that you essentially don't get to vote. Uh, the only thing you can do is propitiate the gods by making sacrifices, but, but that's a kind of holdover of early Vedic philosophy. But they, they are very, very different for sure. So what, so do you do, are you in the West or do you come and look at the both? How, how, I don't how look do at, do I don't use Vedic charts to do readings. I, you know, my technique is really based on Western astrology. It's much more psych, psychotherapeutic. You know, I like that kind of 
psychological somatic model of health and healing. You know, although there are a lot of Eastern elements in it, I mean, I practice Qigong and have done for many years, and, you know, I, 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 I practice things like homeopathy and herbal healing and, and diet, things like that, and nutrition. But I think, I think they're all apart. You know, astrology, astrology primarily is a fabulous language for connecting things, for discovering correspondences. And it, it doesn't really answer any, any questions particularly. But what it does do is it gives you ways to try to understand particular dynamics from a whole different point of view and, and even be drawn to colors, signs, plants, ideas, philosophies that correspond to this. Um, you know, my, my books on reincarnation are, 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 I find, very interesting myself because I, I loved history when I was a kid. I was a kind of um, New York State American history scholar when I was in high school and I didn't have a clue why. And, and it was very interesting because I think that we have very deep roots in time and in history. And I lived out of the US for almost 35 years. And the places where I lived are places where I felt at home, maybe more at home than I feel here. So I, I think it's very interesting looking at, you know, I, I have an astrology system that's, that's, that's run through tarot.com, which is a huge website, that does a reincarnation report for you. It'll take every planet in your horoscope and say when in history it registered. And, you know, it's really quite striking when you realize the undercurrent of your tastes, ideas, attitudes uh, in this lifetime. My ascendant registers around 1580 or 1590 in, in, in the Renaissance. And it was interesting because when I did architecture, I was drawn to the architecture that was made in the late 16th century, Brunelleschi and uh, Leonardo and Michelangelo. It was like the peak of the Renaissance. And then when I began being interested in astrology and metaphysics, I was interested in people like uh, John Dee and, and Marsilio Ficino and um, Giordano Bruno. And they were all around in the late 1500s. And I've spent a lot of time in Italy when I first went, you know, uh, when I was 23 or something to Northern Italy. I walked around Florence and Venice and Rome like I'd been there hundreds of times. I just knew the city. And I, I think, in a way, I was trying to recapture a part of myself. And that maybe is why I don't see any kind of distinction between architecture and astrology. You know, I do feng shui, and my feng shui is a kind of integration of architecture and, and astrology. Any other questions? Um, I came in after you had started, so I saw that you were doing a chart for a BBC reporter, and you had a place that was marked conception, but that was a natal chart that you were working with, Yes. Right? And so then you factored in that person's conception? Yes. So just based on the gestation times? Yeah, that's part of, that's one of the dynamics of the system I developed, which is your whole, it's like a clock of your whole life right. is the, at the horoscope. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't just start at birth, it starts at conception. At conception, yeah. So with that in mind, my question is, um, have you ever considered or would there be a way to do a chart for, uh, for a conception that was never carried to term, like for a miscarriage or something like that? Um, that's a tough one because it's very difficult to date conceptions because even if you know when you made love, uh, I, you may have missed it, but before I mentioned that, that you know, it takes at least 24 hours for the sperm to reach the egg. Right. And the conception can last, uh, you know, the egg being fertilized can be another 24 or 48 hours. So it's often 72 hours or more after the actual sexual act that a conception occurs. And your methodology for determining conception based on birth date is more exact than that? Well, it's, it's, it's in a way a kind of abstract but archetypal point. Oh, I see. Okay. You know, and, and the descriptions of it tends to really tally just because I've had many, many, many clients who remember their own children's conception. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have children and you know when they were born and can do a horoscope for them, 
the system is very interesting because, of course, if you're the mother, then that first part of the horoscope is you and your impact on your child. <coughs> are you pregnant? No, no. Oh. <laughs> you are. <laughs> <laughs> when I was first, when I f was first coming up with these ideas, I knew in the in the early 70s, I, I my daughter was born in late 72, and I split up with her mother when sh she was about six months old, and I raised her alone from that point on. So I, you know, from an eight eight month old baby, I was like walking around with with my my daughter for those years. And, and I worked a lot with a group called the Natural Birth Movement, which was starting up in London then. And so I taught a lot of midwives. I did a kind of class for them. So they could look and watch a birth happen and see which planets were actually around the ascendant. Like Mars on the ascendant means a surgical delivery. The moon or Neptune indicates you know, anesthetic or things like that, or water birth. Water births were very popular in those days. You can actually see the modalities that you're bringing into being. And, and it also tracks the events that happen to you as a mother. Because your, your psychology, the way you see the world and what you do during while you're carrying your child, is transmitted to them very directly. I mean, I find that part of it fascinating. Can I make a quick um, inter interjection? Uh, just that maybe we do two or three more questions, just in the interest of moving along because we still have some amazing music to be shared and then some food to be shared and, and when we get into our casual zone then we can continue the dialogue I'm sure Tab would be happy to answer questions and we can all just you know hang on and have fun um, just to respect I know probably a lot of other people have other places to be as well so um, we can go directly to that why not <laughs> um, but I think I mean, I, I know that there's like some pretty strong hands up, so can maybe I, can I a couple more questions. A, yeah. a question, a, a quick one about the um, evolutionary astrology, and, and you were talking about you've written a lot of books on reincarnation. I'm just curious how you um, map that, like a little bit of detail about how you map that. Do you use Pluto at all, or the moon, or the nodes, and also do you look like in the chart to see, to focus not necessarily on the future or fate, but themes that, the, that we are learning in this life. Yes, definitely, definitely. And also ways, you know, places to go to find out about those themes mm -hmm. on a deeper level. Mm -hmm. um, what I did was, you know, I, I showed you that logarithmic scale that in our life, you know, early events, are, our time sense is very slow, and as we age, time seems to pass faster. In history, it's interesting because the earliest stages of development have vastly long periods of time. Like Aries is almost 20,000 years long. And it gets shorter and shorter as you move towards the present, as, as you know, society becomes denser, more energy is used, and so on. So I just basically project a person's birth horoscope back into the past based on the signs of the zodiac. Aries being 50,000 years ago, it, when, when society was nomadic, and Taurus is the mm -hmm. earth mother culture age. Gemini's when language was developed, Cancer's when the fertility goddesses, Dionysius, Demeter, the, the Greek mysteries probably came into being. Leo is Egypt and Chaldea, and Virgo is Greece and Rome. Libra is the beginning of Islam, and Arthurian legends, and Scorpio is the Dark Ages, and you know the time of the cathedrals. And what's interesting is when you look at the horoscope of, 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 of authors like Thomas Mann, for example, that the times in history that his planets show up occur at the same time as the series of novels that he's written in history. So his Uranus is Joseph, and of Joseph and his brothers. And you know he wrote about his own family, uh, a book called Woodenbrooks, and, and it took place in around 1900, and his Saturn in Aquarius was registered around 1900. So, so in a way, authors, um, actors who play roles in history, uh, Shakespearean people and so on, very often have planets registering at the time in history when significant planets in their horoscope registers. Like Verdi's most famous opera was Aida, and he has Venus and Leo registering during the time, I mean Aida was fictitious, but it's like a couple of hundred years before Christ. 
So it's, it's interesting because it allows you to track essentially a time in history when everyone, when the culture believed what you have in you as a particular personal dynamic now. And, and a lot of my friends who are in, you know, you have to really be interested in history and have some kind of uh, access to it to be able to appreciate it. But those people who do, um, it, it's pretty fascinating. In fact, uh, of this Divine Life book, I actually have a PDF version that's very inexpensive, $10. And I could email it to you if you email me. So it's kind of interesting to see, in fact, on, on, that, um, on the link here, this PDF, I believe it also has a, a list of those dates so you can track your own incarnations. I always joke and say I have moon and Aries that registered like 25,000 BC. <laughs> I jokingly say, you know, it means the woman in me is like a cave woman. You know, it's like very instinctive, very, you know, independent, fiercely uh, territorial in a way. You know, these are all moon and Aries qualities. People with a lot of Taurus are really drawn to plants and, and animals and husbandry and taming animals and things like that. It was the time of the Earth Mother cults. Or, or an artist like Picasso and his connection to Cubism. Picasso has a lot of planets in, in, in Taurus and Scorpio. So, you know, during that Taurian age, the Earth Mother goddesses were these huge women with pronounced stomachs. Picasso's got planets in Taurus that, so he's, he's making paintings that look like this deeper layer of his own collective unconscious, as it were. I, I mean, I think it's fascinating, and people who explore it or have explored it do also. So any other last question? Do any other astrologers use this technique? Is this specific yes. to your practice? Yes, yes, yes. Lifetime astrology, quite a few. It's actually integrated, the list of dates is integrated into the matrix programs, and it's about to become part of a program called Solar Fire. You can just put someone's chart up and press a button, and it produces this list of dates. But remember, I lived and taught in Europe for 30 years until, until 12 years ago, until 2000. So um, most of the people that I taught and trained um, are there. But, but there are a lot of people in this country that use it as well. So thank you, thank you. everyone. I hope you. And I hope I hope you'll invite me back again. Yes. So yes. you know, if you want if you want to follow it up, the the you know, it's fascinating to look at charts with this kind of idea in mind. Yeah, and I can I can vouch for the uh, for the chart reading. I waited my whole life until uh, one of our Saturday sessions consisted of a chart, a reading. It was about an hour and a half, and um, it was pretty fantastic and fascinating. So uh, I know a lot about my what was happening with my mother and father um, during my gestation period, and. He was really just like, and that was that, and that was the relationship, and that was going on, and I was just like, <laughs> whoa. So, yeah, because you, you want to play with your life, you know, you want to really be able to work with what's there, and that's that's really the raw. I, I I have a lot of uh, clients at the moment who are women filmmakers, and it turns out, without them realizing it, their films have these incredibly deeply embedded autobiographical quality, you know, meaning that that it's like they choose projects or choose stories that resonate with elements in them without necessarily being absolutely obvious about it or being clear about it. And it, it, it's a kind of fascinating connection. Anyway, be in touch. Yeah, there, there are even requests for you to come back to that, so I think this is in the future for sure. And, and thanks again, uh, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.